Captain Dan Reynolds strode down the sterile white corridor of the Celestial Hawk, his heavy boots clanging against the metal grating. The grizzled veteran had seen his share of battles and strange encounters during his years leading the Galactic Reconnaissance Force, but the urgent summons from Dr. Vivian Lewis had an ominous air about it. As he approached the observation room, he could hear raised voices arguing heatedly. He stepped around and sounded through the sliding doors to find Dr. Lewis engaged in a fierce debate with Commander Kane Edmund, the Hawk's head of security. I'm telling you, it's too dangerous to keep that thing on board, Edmund growled, jabbing a finger at the one-way mirror. We have no idea what it's capable of. Dr. Lewis stood her ground, and her green eyes flashing. It's a sentient being that has clearly been subjected to horrific experimentation. We have a moral obligation to help it. Moral obligation? Edmund scoffed. To an alien freak that could slaughter us all in our sleep? I say we jettison it out the airlock and be done with it. That's enough, Reynolds barked, his deep voice cutting through the argument like a plasma blade. What seems to be the problem here? Dr. Lewis turned to him, her expression grave. Captain, approximately six hours ago, our long-range scanners detected a small spacecraft adrift in the Antares sector. We brought it aboard and discovered this. She tapped a control panel in the room beyond the one-way mirror illuminated, revealing a sight that made even Reynolds's battle-hardened stomach turn. Hunched on an examination table was a wretched creature, humanoid in shape but horribly emaciated and scarred. Its mottled gray skin was stretched taut over its skeletal frame, and a cruel metal collar encircled its neck. But it was the being's eyes that truly unsettled Reynolds. Huge, sunken orbs that radiated a desperate, pleading intelligence. This was no mindless beast. It had endured unspeakable torment at the hands of some sadistic agency. Preliminary scans indicate extensive surgical procedures and genetic modifications. Dr. Lewis explained, her voice tight with barely restrained anger. The cellular damage suggests it's been subjected to this for months, perhaps years. Reynolds clenched his fists, a cold fury rising within him. He had witnessed the brutality of the Draconian Empire firsthand, seen the atrocities they inflicted on those they deemed inferior. But this, this was a new level of depravity. So what do you propose, Doctor? He asked, though he had a feeling he already knew the answer. We have to help it, Captain, she replied firmly. Study its physiology, try to undo some of the damage, and most importantly, learn what it knows about its captors. Edmund shook his head vehemently. This is a mistake. That thing could be a ticking time bomb. For all we know, the Draconians engineered it as a biological weapon, and this is all an elaborate ruse. Reynolds considered for a long moment, weighing the risks against the potential benefits. The creature's eyes met his through the glass, and in that moment, he made his decision. We're not Draconians, Commander, he said quietly. We don't leave sentient beings to suffer, no matter how different they may be from us. That's what makes us human. He turned to Dr. Lewis. Do what you can for our guest, Doctor, but maintain strict quarantine protocols. I want round-the-clock security on that room. Yes, Captain, she nodded, relief evident on her face. As Reynolds exited the observation room, he couldn't shake the feeling that they were standing on the precipice of something momentous. The tortured being in that room represented a mystery, a potential threat. But it also represented a test of the very ideals humanity claimed to uphold as they ventured out into the stars. Compassion, mercy, the willingness to extend a helping hand even to the most alien of strangers. The true measure of a species lay not in how it treated its friends, but its enemies. And as Reynolds gazed out the viewport at the infinite expanse of space, he silently vowed that whatever challenges lay ahead, humanity would face them with honor and courage. For that was the only way forward into the light. Dr. Lewis stood before the restrained creature, a mixture of fascination and revulsion churning in her gut as she studied its grotesque form. Its chest rose and fell in rapid, shallow breaths, and a sheen of perspiration glistened on its pallid skin. I know you're in pain, she said softly, keeping her voice low and soothing. I want to help you. Can you understand me? For a long moment, the being remained still, its sunken eyes fixed on some distant point. Then slowly, it turned its gaze to meet hers and nodded almost imperceptibly. Dr. Lewis's heart leaped. It was a start, a fragile thread of communication that she would have to nurture carefully. 
She adjusted the settings on her handheld medical scanner and began to run it over the creature's emaciated form, frowning at the deluge of alarming readings that flooded the screen. Massive scar tissue indicative of repeated incisions, she murmured, more to herself than to her patient. Evidence of forced genetic resequencing, cybernetic implants of unknown function. God, what did they do to you? The creature shuddered, a low keening sound escaping its throat. Dr. Lewis looked up sharply, worried that she had inadvertently caused it more distress. But as she met its eyes again, she saw a flicker of something new, a desperate, pleading intensity. Slowly, painfully, the being raised a skeletal hand and pointed to the metal collar that encircled its neck. Dr. Lewis leaned in closer, her brow furrowing as she examined the cruel device. It was clearly more than a simple restraint. Tiny diodes and circuitry were embedded in the metal, pulsing with a faint, sickly light. A neural inhibitor, she breathed, a chill running down her spine. They were controlling your mind, suppressing your will. The creature nodded again, more vigorously this time. Then to Dr. Lewis's amazement, it spoke, its voice a raspy, halting whisper, but the words unmistakably clear. Please, remove it. Dr. Lewis hesitated, torn between her scientific curiosity and her concern for her patient's well-being. The collar was a vital piece of evidence, a window into the twisted machinations of the creature's captors. But the raw, naked desperation in its plea was impossible to ignore. Stealing herself, she reached for a laser scalpel and began to carefully cut through, tore through the collar's locking mechanism, her hands steady despite the tension coiled in her muscles. With a final precise incision, the device fell away, clattering to the floor. The effect was immediate and startling. The creature's body went rigid, its back arching as a guttural scream tore from its throat. Dr. Lewis leaped back, her heart pounding, as the being thrashed against its restraints, its eyes rolling back in its head. For a terrifying moment, she feared she had made a terrible mistake, that the sudden removal of the neural inhibitor had triggered some catastrophic neurological cascade. But just as quickly as it had begun, the seizure subsided, leaving the creature panting and trembling on the table. Slowly it raised its head, its eyes clearer and more focused than Dr. Lewis had yet seen. When it spoke again, its voice was stronger, steadier. Thank you, it rasped. You have no idea what it was like to be a prisoner in my own mind. Dr. Lewis swallowed hard, trying to regain her composure. Who did this to you? She asked, although she feared she already knew the answer. The creature's face contorted in a rictus of hatred. The Draconians, it spat. They captured me on a scouting mission, tortured me for information. When I wouldn't break, they decided to make me their lab rat. Dr. Lewis's stomach churned with revulsion. The Draconian Empire's cruelty was well documented. But this, this was a new level of depravity. I'm so sorry, she whispered, feeling the inadequacy of the words even as she spoke them. We'll do everything we can to help you heal, to undo what they did. The creature looked at her, a flicker of something like hope in its eyes. My name is Uran, it said softly. I was a scientist before, before all this. Dr. Lewis felt a lump form in her throat. To be reduced from a sentient, sapient being to a tortured husk, it was a fate she couldn't begin to imagine. I'm Dr. Vivian Lewis, she replied, extending a hand before realizing the absurdity of the gesture given Uran's restraints. And I promise you, Oren, we will find a way to make this right. As she gazed into those haunted, otherworldly eyes, Dr. Lewis felt a grim determination settle over her. The Draconian Empire had sown the seeds of cruelty and suffering across the galaxy for too long. It was time for humanity to stand against the darkness, to be a beacon of hope for all those who suffered under the yoke of tyranny. And as she looked at Uran, broken and battered, but still clinging to a shred of defiant hope, she knew that the fight would be worth it. No matter the cost, Captain Reynolds stared at the star map projected above the Celestial Hawks Bridge, his brow furrowed in concentration. The Antari sector sprawled before him, a vast expanse of unexplored space at the edge of human-controlled territory. Somewhere out there amidst the swirling nebulae and glittering constellations lurked the draconian outpost where Urin had been held captive and experimented upon. Any luck triangulating the origin point of Urin's escape pod? He asked, glancing over at Lieutenant Evelyn Bryan, the ship's navigator. 
Brian shook her head, frustration evident on her face. Negative, Captain. The pod's navigational data was heavily corrupted. Best I can give you is a general radius of a few light years. Reynolds sighed, rubbing a hand over his stubbled jaw. It had been three days since they had brought Urin aboard, and while Dr. Lewis had made significant progress in stabilizing his condition, the question of his captor's location remained maddeningly elusive. The sound of the bridge doors sliding open drew Reynolds' attention. He turned to see Commander Edmund striding in, his face set in a grim expression. Captain, I need to speak with you, privately. Reynolds frowned, not liking the tone of Edmund's voice. He nodded to Brian, signaling for her to take the con, and followed Edmund into his ready room just off the bridge. As soon as the doors slid shut behind them, Edmund rounded on Reynolds, his eyes blazing with barely contained anger. What the hell are we doing, Dan? He demanded. We should be alerting Galactic Command, requesting reinforcements, not playing nursemaid to some alien freak. Reynolds's own temper flared at Edmund's callous words. That freak is a sentient being who's been the real one all through hell, he snapped. And in case you've forgotten, Commander, we're sworn to protect all sapient life, not just humans. Edmund scoffed. Protect? We don't even know what it is, let alone whose side it's on. For all we know, this whole thing could be an elaborate trap. Reynolds shook his head, a weary sigh escaping his lips. He knew Edmund's concerns were not entirely unfounded. They were venturing into uncharted territory, both literally and figuratively. But he also knew, with a bone-deep certainty, that abandoning Uran to his fate was not an option. Kane, he said quietly, using Edmund's first name in an effort to break through his belligerence. I know you have your doubts, but I need you to trust me on this. We have a chance to strike a blow against the Draconians, to show them that their cruelty will not go unanswered. Edmund was silent for a long moment, his jaw clenched tight. Then slowly he nodded. I don't like it, he said bluntly, but I'll follow your lead for now. Reynolds clapped him on the shoulder, a gesture of gratitude and understanding. That's all I ask. As Edmund left the ready room, Reynolds turned back to the star map his eyes tracing the vast, uncharted expanse before him. Somewhere out there amidst the cold and endless void lay the answers they sought, and he would not rest until he found them. Dr. Lewis sat at her desk in the medical bay, poring over the latest scans of Uran's physiology. The more she studied the alien's tortured form, the more she realized just how much she still had to learn. The sound of a soft, tentative knock at the door drew her attention. She looked up to see Uran standing there, looking strangely small and vulnerable without the bulk of the examination table around him. Uran, she said, rising to her feet, you should be resting. Your body has been through a tremendous ordeal. The alien scientist shook his head, a wry smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. I've rested enough for a lifetime, doctor, he said softly. Now I want to help. Dr. Lewis hesitated, torn between her medical instincts and her growing respect for Uran's resilience. Finally, she nodded. All right, she said, but if you start to feel any pain or discomfort, you tell me immediately, understood? Urin nodded, his eyes shining with gratitude. Understood. Together they bent over the scans, two brilliant minds from vastly different worlds united in a common purpose. As they worked, Dr. Lewis couldn't help but marvel at the strength of the being beside her. Two have endured such unimaginable torment and still emerge with a fierce determination to fight back. It was a testament to the indomitable nature of the sapient spirit. And as she looked at Uran, she knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, they would face them together. United in hope, united in purpose, united in their humanity, no matter what form it took. The celestial hawk sliced through the void, its sleek hull gleaming in the starlight. On the bridge, Captain Reynolds stood tall and resolute, his eyes fixed on the view screen as the ship hurtled towards its destination. Approaching coordinates, Captain, Lieutenant Brian reported, her fingers flying over this navigation console. ETA to Draconian outpost, 10 minutes. Reynolds nodded, a grim smile tugging at his lips. Good. Let's hope our little surprise party catches them off guard. He glanced over at Uran, who stood beside him, his alien features set in a mask of determination. In the days since his rescue, the scientist had proven an invaluable asset providing detailed intelligence on the layout and defenses of the outpost where he had been held. Are you sure you're up for this? Reynolds asked quietly, knowing the toll that returning to the site of his torment must be taking on Iran. 
The alien nodded, his eyes glinting with a fierce resolve. I have to be, he said simply. I won't let them do to others what they did to me. Reynolds clapped him on the shoulder, a gesture of solidarity and respect. Then he turned to face the view screen once more, his jaw set in a hard line. All right, people, he said, his voice ringing out across the bridge. Let's show these draconian bastards what happens when they mess with the wrong species. A chorus of affirmatives echoed back at him, the crew's determination palpable in the air. Reynolds felt a swell of pride in his chest. These were the finest men and women he had ever served with, and he knew they would not let him down. As the outpost loomed into view, a twisted mass of metal and flickering lights, Reynolds felt a cold fury settle over him. The Draconians had preyed on the weak and the innocent for too long, secure in their belief that they were untouchable. But they had never faced the likes of humanity before. All weapons, fire at will, he ordered, his voice cold and hard as steel. Let's give them a wake-up call they won't soon forget. The Celestial Hawk's cannons roared to life, lancing out with beams of searing energy that slammed into the outpost shields. The Draconians returned fire, their own weapons a sickly green against the blackness of space. But the human ship's defenses held firm. Shields at 80%, Commander Edmund reported from his station at Tactical. We're giving as good as we're getting, Captain. Reynolds nodded, his eyes never leaving the view screen. Keep the pressure on, he said. We need to buy time for the boarding party. Even as he spoke, a small shuttle was launching from the Celestial Hawks hangar bay, carrying a hand-picked team of Marines and one very determined alien scientist. Their mission was simple but daring, to infiltrate the outposts, gather any intelligence they could find, and plant a series of explosive charges that would reduce the facility to rubble. As the shuttle streaked towards the outpost, weaving and dodging through the chaos of the battle, Reynolds felt a twinge of fear in his gut. He knew the risks they were taking, knew that every member of that team was putting their life on the line for the greater good. But he also knew that they would not fail. They could not fail. For the sake of every sapient being in the galaxy, they had to succeed. Dr. Lewis crouched behind a twisted piece of metal, her heart pounding in her chest as energy beams sizzled overhead. Beside her, Uran and a trio of Marines were exchanging fire with a group of draconian soldiers their faces grim and focused in the flickering light of the outpost's alarms. They had made it inside the facility, thanks to Uren's knowledge of its layout and security systems, but their presence had not gone unnoticed for long. Now they were fighting for every inch of ground, determined to reach the outpost's central control room and the secrets it held. We need to keep moving, Uran urged, his voice taut with tension. The longer we stay in one place, the more time they have to box us in. Dr. Lewis nodded, stealing herself for the next push forward. She had never been a soldier, had never imagined herself in the midst of a firefight like this, but she knew that she could not let her fear control her. Too much was riding on their success. With a deep breath, she signaled to the Marines, and together they surged forward, their weapons blazing as they cut a path through the draconian defenses. The air was thick with the stench of ozone and burning metal, the floor slick with the blood of the fallen. But still, they pushed on, driven by a fierce determination to see their mission through to the end. As they rounded a final corner, the control room came into view, a vast chamber lined with banks of flickering monitors and pulsing consoles. And there, in the center of it all, stood a figure that made Dr. Lewis's blood run cold. It was a draconian, but unlike any she had ever seen before. Its scales were a deep, glossy black shot through with veins of pulsing red. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent intelligence, and when it spoke, its voice was a sibilant hiss that seemed to coil around the room like a living thing. Welcome, humans, it said, its lips curling in a cruel smile. I have been expecting you. Dr. Lewis felt a chill run down her spine as she stared at the draconian, her grip tightening on her weapon. Beside her, Uran let out a low hiss of recognition his eyes blazing with hatred. Korzak, he spat, the name dripping with venom. I should have known you'd be behind this. The draconian chuckled, a sound like claws scraping against metal. Ah, Uran, he said, his voice dripping with mock affection. My favorite test subject. I'm so glad you could join us for this little reunion. Dr. Lewis glanced at Uran, saw the pain and anger etched into every line of his face. 
She could only imagine the horrors he had endured at this monster's hands, the depths of cruelty he had been subjected to. It's over, Korzak, she said, her voice ringing out clear and strong. Surrender now, and we'll show you the mercy you never showed your victims. The draconian's eyes flashed with amusement. Mercy, he hissed. What a quaint human concept. You really think you can stop us with your pretty words and your primitive weapons? He gestured to the monitors that lined the walls, each one displaying a different scene of carnage and destruction. Dr. Lewis felt her stomach twist as she realized what she was seeing. The celestial hawk, battered and broken, drifting helplessly in space. The draconian fleet closing in like a pack of hungry wolves. Even now my ships are tearing your pathetic vessel apart, Korzak gloated, and when they're finished, they'll come for you. You'll all make such fascinating specimens. Dr. Lewis heard Uran let out a low growl of rage, saw him raise his weapon with trembling hands. But before he could fire, a new voice cut through the air, a voice that sent a shiver of hope down her spine. I wouldn't be so sure about that, you scaly bastard. It was Captain Reynolds striding into the room with a squad of Marines at his back. His face was battered and bruised, his uniform torn and stained with blood, but his eyes blazed with a fierce, unyielding determination. Korzak whirled to face him, his features twisting with rage. How? He snarled. How did you survive? Reynolds grinned, a feral, predatory expression. You underestimated us, he said simply. You thought you could break us, could crush our spirit. But you forgot one thing. He raised his weapon, pointing it directly at Korzak's heart. We're human, he said, his voice ringing out like a clarion call. And we never, ever give up. With those words, he opened fire, and the room erupted into chaos. Dr. Lewis dove for cover, her heart pounding in her chest as energy beams sizzled overhead. She saw Uran beside her, his face set in a mask of grim determination as he returned fire, saw the Marines fanning out to flank the draconian forces. And in the center of it all, she saw Captain Reynolds, a man possessed, fighting with a savage, relentless fury that took her breath away. He was like a force of nature, unstoppable and unyielding, cutting through the draconian ranks like a scythe through wheat. In that moment, Dr. Lewis felt a swell of pride and awe rising in her chest. This was what it meant to be human, she realized, to stand against the darkness, no matter the odds, and fight for what was right. And as she watched Reynolds and his Marines push the draconians back, as she saw the hope and determination blazing in their eyes, she knew that they would not fail. For they were the best of humanity, the brightest and the bravest, and they would not rest until the galaxy was safe once more. In the end, it was over almost as quickly as it had begun. The Draconians, for all their cruelty and arrogance, were no match for the fury of the human spirit. They fell before the onslaught like leaves before a storm, their weapons clattering to the ground as they surrendered or fled. And Korzak, the architect of so much suffering, lay dead at Captain Reynolds's feet, his black scales stained with the blood of his own defeat. As the smoke cleared and the alarms fell silent, Dr. Lewis looked around at the faces of her comrades, at Uran, his eyes shining with a newfound hope, at the Marines, their faces lined with weariness, but their spirits unbroken, and at Captain Reynolds standing tall and proud amidst the wreckage, a beacon of strength and courage in the darkness. It's over, he said softly, his voice heavy with emotion. We did it. Dr. Lewis nodded, a lump forming in her throat. We did, she agreed. But the fight isn't over yet. There will be others like Korzak, other threats to face. Reynolds met her gaze, his eyes blazing with a fierce, unwavering determination. And we'll be ready for them, he said, his voice ringing out like a promise. We'll stand together, human and alien alike, and we'll face whatever comes. He reached out, clasping Urin's hand in a gesture of friendship and solidarity. For we are the guardians of the galaxy, he said his words echoing through the chamber like a rallying cry, and we will never, ever back down. As the survivors of the Celestial Hawk gathered around their captain, their faces shining with pride and purpose, Dr. Lewis felt a swell of hope rising in her chest. For she knew that as long as there were those willing to stand against the darkness, as long as the human spirit remained unbroken and unbowed, there would always be light in the galaxy. The Celestial Hawk limped back into port, its hull scarred and battered, 
but its spirit unbroken. As the ship settled into its berth, a cheer went up from the gathered crowd, a cheer that spoke of hope, of triumph, of the indomitable will of the human race. Captain Reynolds stood on the bridge, his eyes fixed on the view screen as the ship's ramp lowered to the ground. Beside him, Dr. Lewis and Iran watched in silence, their faces etched with a mix of exhaustion and elation. We did it, Reynolds said, softly, his voice thick with emotion. We struck a blow against the Draconians that they won't soon forget. Dr. Lewis nodded, a small smile tugging at the corners of her mouth. And we couldn't have done it without you, Uran, she said, turning to face the alien scientist. Your courage, your knowledge, you were invaluable. Uran ducked his head, looking almost embarrassed by the praise. I only did what I had to, he said quietly. What any of you would have done in my place. Reynolds clapped him on the shoulder, a gesture of friendship and respect. Don't sell yourself short, he said firmly. You're a hero, Uran, and you'll always have a place among us. As they stepped out onto the ramp, blinking in the bright sunlight, they were met by a sea of faces. The faces of their crewmates, their families, the people they had sworn to protect. And in that moment, Dr. Lewis felt a swell of pride and love so strong it brought tears to her eyes. For this was what they had fought for, what they had risked everything to preserve, the right of every sapient being to live in peace and freedom, to chart their own course among the stars. And as she looked out at the crowd, at the hope and determination shining in their eyes, she knew that the fight was far from over. There would be other threats to face, other battles to be won, but they would face them together, human and alien alike, united in their common cause. For they were the guardians of the galaxy, the defenders of the light, and they would never ever back down. In the weeks and months that followed, the story of the Celestial Hawk's victory spread like wildfire across the galaxy. The Draconians, once thought invincible, had been dealt a blow from which they would not soon recover. A blow struck by the courage and determination of a single ship and its crew. And at the center of it all was Uran, the alien scientist who had been through hell and back, and emerged stronger for it. He became a symbol of hope for all those who had suffered under the Draconian's cruel reign, a living reminder that even the darkest night must eventually give way to dawn. Under Dr. Lewis's care, he began the long and painful process of healing, both physically and emotionally. It was a journey that would take a lifetime, but one that he would not have to walk alone for he had found a new family aboard the Celestial Hawk, a family bound not by blood, but by the unbreakable ties of shared purpose and sacrifice. And as he looked to the future, to the countless worlds that awaited them beyond the stars, he knew that whatever challenges lay ahead, they would face them together, always.